Seems to be. Okay, so many thanks for the invitation uh, from the host. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I think the last talk actually frames quite nicely what I want to say now. Uh, in fact, with hindsight, I could have perhaps given it the title um, Challenges to the Digitization of Democracy. But... Okay, so let me just quickly say what I plan to present, time permitting. Um, so I'd like to say a little bit, are we getting strong echoes or is it just me that it sounds okay to you? Yeah. I see what you mean about it yeah. sounding strange on the, okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about threats to democracy, although I think we've had some sort of strong hints of that already in the previous talk, so I can go over that pretty quickly. Um, and then I, what I would like to do is focus in on what is my own, well, one of my specialities, which is trying to secure elections, particularly uh, in the presence of in, sort of increasing presence of digitization. Um, and then I'll talk, uh, I'll very briefly introduce a sort of new concept which this, the cryptographers and the information security people have tried to introduce to this problem, the so-called notion of end-to-end -end verifiability. I'll talk briefly about that. And then I'll talk, I'll present very quickly my own scheme, Prêt de Voté, which attempts to do this. And then finally, I'll try and present another more recent scheme, which tries to do this in a kind of more, uh, we hope, kind of acceptable way to people. So of, uh, avoids, puts much more of the crypto below the bonnet, if you like, so hopefully makes it more accept acceptable to the electorate and to voting officials and so forth. And then maybe we'll have a few minutes for discussion, hopefully. Okay, so uh, as I say, I guess some of these things have already been hinted at, um, and I'm pleased to see that I guess Professor Fiori Fiorici, no, sorry, <laughs> Luciano, um, and I, I think share share views on Brexit and uh, the recent US election. I mean, I think we've seen some major disasters in the process of election. Um, where to, what, what caused these, what in, certainly in my view are, are disasters, is of course open to a lot of debate. Um, people have suggested various things like the, the Russian interference in, for, for example, the campaign process, but there have also been hints that maybe they actually interfered directly with, with the, the process of voting. We don't really have any clear evidence that that's the case, but on the other hand, we don't really have evidence that it uh, shows that it, it didn't occur. And indeed, it's, it's quite clear that it could easily have happened. Uh, the potential for such hacking is, is clearly present. Um, and then, of course, we have all the other surrounding issues, which again have been hinted at, the, uh, well, to use the euphemistic term, alternative news, but more directly fake news, the notion of information bubbles, uh, potentially even issues of chilling effect of you know, mass surveillance. So there's all kinds of issues like this that digitization is bringing, uh, which you know, threaten the process of democracy. You know, potentially, uh, digitization could really help with democracy, as we were sort of hinting just a moment ago. I guess the, the dream was that the internet and so forth would make information much more accessible to everyone. It seems to be making fake uh, information much more available to people is in effect. There are various responses to this. You can take what some people might argue the slightly Luddite approach, which the Dutch are proposing to use in their upcoming elections, which is basically go back to standard you know, hand counting of paper ballots. Uh, other things like a few days ago, some of you may have heard that GCHQ, which is the sort of British NSA, uh, have made an offer to help the political parties to try and make their, their systems more secure. Uh, and uh, Tim Berners-Lee, of course, in a few, a few days ago, has started to make proposals as to how we might make the internet more accountable, try and counter issues of fake news and so forth. So that's all the sort of surrounding issue. Um, and now, of course, clearly elections are very complex socio-technical systems um, and the actual process of casting and counting votes is only one small part of that, if you like. There's all the surrounding stuff of how you set up the electoral rolls, there's all the campaigning and media and so on and so forth. Um, I'd love to talk about that, but we don't have time to do that. So what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk is one part of the problem, an important part of the problem. Uh, which is the process of trying to make sure that the casting and counting of votes is done uh, accurately, but preserving uh, ballot privacy. Um, and of course, in the States, 
the digitization becomes a really significant issue because even now, uh, a significant part of the electorate were voting on pure touchscreen machines. So they just you know, touch the screen, select uh, Trump or whoever, and you know, how that's actually counted, you have to trust in the software to uh, register that, that vote correctly. Um, so that's really, a really scary prospect. And so we'd like to try and get away from that. Oh, and of course, historically, there have been major instances of uh, mistrust. You know, this where is my vote. Um, OK, just to very quickly give you a hint. So interestingly, I only discovered this a sort of decade back. In the US, they've actually been experimenting with various technologies for well over a century in an attempt, if you like, to transfer trust away from human beings into some form of technology. It's kind of interesting. Um, so these lever machines uh, actually were introduced at the end of the 19th century, and I think in some places like New York State, they even are still used, which is kind of slightly incredible. So these are kind of two-ton machines where you, you fiddle with the little levers, and at the end you, you pull this big red lever across to cast your vote. Um, sort of more recent things are optical scan machines, which are actually probably more, more one of the more reliable technologies. Uh, the, the really scary one that I just mentioned is the touchscreen. Okay, so there you really just have to trust the software behind the, the system. There are some slight improvements on this in the sense that you put a, a printer on the side which prints out your vote and the vote is supposed to check that and that gets put into a ballot box. So in theory, you could do uh, some sort of recount on that. Of course, in practice, as we saw recently in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and stuff, le legal obstructions actually prevented that even though it was uh, possible to actually do recounts. It was legally obstructed, which is interesting in itself. And then some of you who followed the media a few years back probably remember this kind of stuff from, I guess this is 2000 or 2004, I forget, but, uh, to do with the punch, uh, punch card machines, uh, the Holrith kind of things. Okay, so let me get on to the, the meat of what I want to say. So the, the challenge that I and other crypto information security people have been addressing for, well, several decades now really, but intensively, I guess, for the last decade or so, is this issue of how do we make elections secure while at the same time guaranteeing the privacy of all votes? I mean, this is the, the challenge, the, the tension that we have. Uh, we don't have a God's eye view. We can't, by definition, you know, know what all people, all everybody's votes. So we have no way of knowing from the exterior, if you like, whether the announced result is correct. So we're having to to uh, reconcile this tension between, on the, the one hand, sort of traceability, verifiability, whatever you want to call it, and the secrecy of the ballot. Um, and being cryptographers, naturally rather paranoid, we want to try and do this with sort of minimal trust. We don't want to have to trust software supplied by Diebold or Sequoia or whatever. We don't want to have to trust election officials and things like this. We want to do it in a way which makes the whole thing very auditable and accountable um, so if anybody tries to cheat, we can detect them and hopefully fix it. That's, that's the goal, and it's, it's tough. So let me now quickly mention this notion of end-to-end -end verifiability, which is, if you like, the sort of cryptographer's way to try to solve this. How acceptable that is to society in general is not entirely clear, and I'd be very interested actually to hear the audience reaction uh, to this kind of concept. So the idea here is, in a sense, to put the verification in the hands of the individual voters themselves, to give each voter a way to confirm to their own satisfaction that their vote accurately ends up in, in the final count, but at the same time, of course, uh, avoiding any dangers of vote buying or coercion. So even though that they, they have this capability, they should not be able, if you like, they can convince themselves, but they should not be able to convince anyone else of the way they voted. And I think probably immediately you can see this is a very delicate thing to, to, uh, to pull off. And it uses all the sort of trickery of modern crypto to, to achieve that. And I won't have much time to go into the technicalities, of course, but I'll try and give you a hint. Um, so the way this usually goes, the, uh, the Salini scheme that I'll talk about at the end actually breaks with this tradition. But first of all, I think it's good to introduce uh, the sort of standard way of doing it, is that at the time of casting the vote, an encryption of the vote is created in, in some way, um, and the voter is given, say, a printout of the, the encrypted vote, which they can keep as a receipt. Uh, and the point of this is that later on, we will have this notion of some kind of bulletin board, 
typically a web bulletin board, but it could be you know, a printout in the, the Times of London or something. Uh, all of these encrypted votes should be published in some way and visible to everyone. And so this gives each voter an opportunity to go to this and check that their particular encrypted vote appears correctly and uncorrupted. Uh, and then once you've got this set of encrypted votes sort of publicly visible, what you, and you've sort of agreed it, any sort of challenges uh, have been resolved, then you have to process these in some way to extract the, the plain text votes, uh, compute the, the, the result, uh, but again without violating privacy, of course. So there are some standard cryptographic ways of doing this in a verifiable way, which we don't really have time to go into now, but maybe we can talk about it briefly in the coffee break or in the discussion. Um, so that's that third bullet. So ho hopefully that gives you a, a very high level impression of how this, this uh, goal is achieved. So pictorially it would look a bit like this. Uh, so to the right, this is a rather crude drawing by me. I'm not, not very well, uh, draft, uh, not very good draftsmanship, I'm afraid. Uh, but th this is meant to be a, uh, some kind of depiction of this web bulletin board concept. So the first, first column would be the raw encrypted votes as created by the voters at the time of casting their votes. And then typically what will happen is they will go, uh, well, one way of doing it is to take them through so-called re-encryption mixes. So the, the encryptions are transformed in such a way that you cannot link, link them together. You can go through multiple mixes, and at the end you can decrypt them, and you get the votes in the clear, uh, but not linkable back to the receipts, and hence not back to the voter. So again, that's the, the high-level concept. So the kind of requirements, I'll just very quickly go through these are kind of obvious. You want uh, to guarantees of integrity, that votes are not uh, corrupted on their way from, if you like, the voter's mind to the final uh, plain text in the right-hand column of this web bulletin board. Um, so individual voters should be able to verify their own vote in some way. Uh, and well, let me skip over the other notions. but. On the flip side, we have the, the security privacy requirements. So there's the elementary notion of ballot privacy. Um, but it turns out with the kind of schemes that I'm describing here, you need actually a more powerful concept. Just having uh, ballot privacy, if you like, was conceived when we were thinking of an attacker who was just kind of passive, just observed the, the election process. Now we, we need to think about more aggressive attackers who might actually interact with the voters, you know, ask them to reveal their passwords and secret keys and so on and so forth. So we actually need more sophisticated concepts. Again, I won't go into the technicalities of them, but you, you get the feel. Um, okay, so let me just give a hint as to you know, how the assurance argument here works. So our goal is to give everyone, well, first of all, individual voters, the, the conviction that their vote is accurately ends up in, in the final tabulation. And so collectively, if you know, all the voters are convinced of this, that should turn into a sort of collective societal conviction uh, that the outcome is correct. Um, and with the kind of scheme that I've just described to you, there are basically three parts of this argument. First of all, voters need to be sure that their vote is correctly encrypted in this receipt. Um, then they need some way of uh, checking that their votes get into the tally, which is what I described in the web bulletin board, their ability to check the receipt is there. Uh, and then there are fairly standard sort of cryptographic procedures once we've got this set of encrypted votes uh, to ensure that they are correctly uh, anonymized and decrypted at the end. So we need to assure all sort of three part, these three parts of the argument. Uh, and in a way, the, the hardest one to achieve is, is the first one. Uh, because that's the one at the edge when it's the interface to the voter themselves. How do we convince voters you know, that this scramble of, of bit, random looking bits is actually an accurate representation ultimately of their vote? Um, now that's, that's hard, that's the really tricky part. Um, there are various ways of doing it, so what I'll do now quickly is just introduce my own uh, way of doing it, the so-called pre pre uh, uh scheme. Uh, which was actually used a couple of years back in, in Australia for some real votes, uh, real election there. And really the key idea, again, I won't go into the, the technicalities, but the key idea is actually very simple. Voters get 
at least for a UK voter, a very standard looking receipt. I'll show it in the next slide, which just has down the left hand side has a list of the candidates and you put a cross or maybe a ranking or whatever it is against those candidates. But the crucial point is that each ballot has this order of the candidates randomized on it. And there's an encryption of the representation of this randomized order uh, buried uh, on, the, on the, the form itself. And that, that is, of course, later used to interpret what the cross or whatever means. So you'd have a ballot which would look a bit like this. Um, so on this one, you have this particular order, but if you pulled out another ballot form, you'd have a, a different random order. And you'd have a different cipher text on the bottom right-hand side. Okay, so now the voter gets this perhaps in an envelope, goes off to the, the booth, and in the booth, let's say they mark a cross for panoramics, and then, oh, the animation didn't work. Normally there's a great animation, the, the left-hand side goes up in flames, but, uh, oh, did it, okay. Oh, very good, all right. There must be something weird about this space up on the, the stage, you don't see things or hear things as they really are. Digitization, right? Okay, good, well, you saw it then. So. The, the left-hand side is destroyed, and now you're left with what is effectively your receipt. Okay, so I think you can see immediately that as long as that, uh, the plain text order of the candidates has been destroyed, anyone seeing now this receipt cannot interpret that vote without being able to decrypt the cipher text. Okay, so that's the way in Preto Vote that the encryption of the vote is achieved. And in order to assure yourself that this encryption is correct, what you actually do is the voter is and possibly independent observers, can pick up these forms at random and just say, I want to audit it, which basically means the encryption is opened up and you can check that the order in the encryption is consistent with the printed plain text order. Okay, so if you do that with a large number and they all turn up okay, you can be fairly confident that the, the whole batch of ballots is correctly constructed in this sense, and therefore, on any individual one, your vote will be correctly encrypted. Does that sort of make sense at a high level? So that's, that's the key idea. Okay, so I'd be very interested to hear people's reactions later to, you know, would you believe, would you feel confident, comfortable using such a system? I'd be very interested to hear about it. Uh, I've certainly encountered people um, who are not comfortable with this and don't like this idea of voters having to handle an encrypted ballot. And it was that kind of uh, hostility, if you like, uh, opposition, that prompted me to think and try and explore a more intuitive way for voters to do this verification rather than having to go through this sort of indirection of an encrypted representation on the web bulletin board and so forth that you saw earlier. Um, oh, yes, sorry, that's a few remarks about uh, the ballot. I think I've covered those already. So let me move on to this, this new scheme which we hope is more kind of accessible and intu intuitive. So let me quickly try and describe that. I think we have a little bit of time. Um, so, yes, as I say, what I've, the kind of scheme I've just described is, well, from a cryptographer's point of view, is very elegant, very powerful, but it's not clear, you know, we tried to sell these approaches to election officials and so forth, and it's, it's a really hard sell. Um, so here's a, here's a different approach. Um, so the, the idea in itself is not new, um, the idea of sort of vote trackers has been around for quite some time. So it's analogous, if you like, to trackers of you know, UPS parcel. Um, so every voter would be given a unique tracker number. Uh, and now we, on, the, on this web bulletin board, this my mystical web bulletin board, we post the tracker numbers with the uh, plain text vote against them. So you would get perhaps a bulletin board like this. Okay, so now you know your individual tracker, you can go to this and check that the correct vote is there. And now, you know, the whole list of votes is uh, visible in plain text to everyone to you know, reproduce the count if, if they want. Okay, so that's clearly much more intuitive, um, but there are issues with this. Uh, if you sort of pause and scratch beneath, beneath the surface, um, first of all, we need to guarantee that every voter gets a unique tracker and I think it's fairly obvious that if there are collisions of trackers, there's potential for the system to manipulate things. Um, 
And of course, we have to keep the trackers secret in order to avoid vote buying or coercion uh, threats. Um, and we need to keep them secret even against you know, potentially aggressive, active attackers who approach voters and tell them, you know, you must reveal to me your tracker and so I can check the, your, play, your vote uh, just as you can. So it's a very simple idea, but it hasn't really been taken very seriously by the crypto community. Um, but I found, you know, as you do, well, one morning in the shower, I was mulling over it again. And it occurred to me, well, actually, maybe we can address these two issues uh, using so, some cryptographic techniques. And so what I'll try and do in the few minutes I have left is, OK, good. Um, I'll try and give you at least a, a quick hint of how, how, how this works. Um, well, the coercion attack is, I guess, fairly obvious to you. So the, the, the coercer approaches a voter, let's say, before the, the, votes, uh, the voting occurs and says, you know, tell me your tracker number and then I can check which way you vote. Um, but then the thought was, I mean, I think everybody who thought about this kind of scheme in the past had implicitly assumed the voters knew their tracker numbers before they cast their vote, and in fact, probably cast the vote with the tracker number. And the thought was, well, actually, they don't need to know their tracker number at the time they cast it. They only need it later on to do the verification. So how about if we only notify the voters after things have been posted on the web bulletin board, um, then if they are being coerced, well, first of all, they can't, if the coercer says, you know, what's your tracker number? Well, I don't know it. I haven't been told it yet. And if they come later on, the voter obviously has the opportunity to go to the web bulletin board, find a suitable vote that the coercer is asking for, and just picks off a tracker number that points to it and claims that that's their tracker number. Um, so that's the key idea, is to actually notify the voters uh, after things have been posted on the web bulletin board of their tracker number. Uh, but we had to do that in, a, in a, a careful way because we have to guarantee that they, the tracker number that they've been told is their true tracker, and furthermore, it has to be done in a sort of deniable way. It, the, it must be convincing again to the voter themselves, but not convincing to the voter. The voter should be able to lie to the coercer as to what their tracker number is. So let me just try and give you a quick hint of how this works. OK, so I guess I jumped ahead of myself. That sort of restates what I just said. Uh, and furthermore, of course, being cryptographers, we want to do this in a way with sort of minimal trust either for the integrity or, or, the, or the secrecy. So we actually will do this in a sort of distributed way. There will be a bunch of entities which will come together, and I'll give you a hint of how that works now. Um, so I think this is about the most technical slide. Um, for those of you who know about it, we actually use something called Elgamal encryption, which is a sort of randomizing uh, encryption. The details don't really matter very much, uh, but we'll assume that there's a, a, a threshold key announced by the election officials, this PK. Uh, we're also assuming that voters have uh, secret signing and trap door keys, to two secret keys uh, for this process. Uh, and in the setup before election starts, what, what we have to do is, uh, for each voter, we need a row on this web bulletin board, which is, first of all, equipped with the following information. So it'll have the voter's public key, so the ith voter has PKI. We will have an encryption of their tracker number, NI, and we'll have a trapdoor commitment to that tracker number. And I'll just say a little bit more about how these things are done then. Um, so the PKI, that's, that's trivial. We, we have presumably a registration list, so we have all the voters' names and their PKIs, so we can, that we can simply write up to the web bulletin board. What we need now are these encryptions of the tracker numbers. And the way we do this in a way which will guarantee the uniqueness of the trackers is that we actually start by just publishing a list of distinct tracker numbers, sufficient for all the voters. We encrypt them using this Elgamal encryption. And then we put them through so-called verifiable shuffles. So I sort of hinted at that when I talked about the tabulation process. We can actually take this set of uh, encrypted tracker numbers in this case, and we can transform each one, and we can do a secret shuffle on them. We can do this repeatedly. OK, and so at the end, we have these multiply shuffled, transformed encryptions, and we can simply align them against the PKI, the, the voter identifiers. So now the, the association of tracker numbers with the voter identities is, 
is concealed in these multiple shuffles. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so that's the way we guarantee, uh, assuming that we can guarantee the, the, the integrity of the shuffling process, and there are techniques, standard techniques to do that, we guarantee the uniqueness of this, these assignments. But the assignments are kept secret for the time being, not even revealed to the voters themselves. Okay, so we've got to this point. Uh, now we need to construct this uh, trapdoor commitment, and I won't go through the details of how this is done in a distributed way, but basically the goal is to get to this last line. Um, so what we post to the web bulletin board is the tracker number multiplied by um, a trapdoor public key for the voter. So this HI is a special trapdoor. Uh, the voter holds the corresponding secret key, and this is raised to a random RI. Okay, so that serves to conceal the, the value of the, the tracker number. So basically we get to the end of the setup phase of now for each voter we have this triple, we have their public key, we have the encryption of their tracker number, and we have this trapdoor commitment for which the voter holds the trapdoor secret. Okay, and we're all set to start voting. Um, so the voting process can be fairly conventional in this context. Um, the, the voter uses their laptop, say, tell, tells it the vote. The laptop encrypts that vote under the public key of the authorities, of, of the, the, the tally, tally uh, servers, and it signs it with the voter's individual signature. And this is uh, sent in, and it's posted now in the appropriate row. Okay? So once uh, the vote, uh, voting has finished, all of these signatures be, can be uh, verified. We can throw away any that don't check out. We can throw away any duplicates, uh, select according to some rule, perhaps the, the last one signed by a particular key. And so now we can move to the tabulation phase. So we basically extract from this, uh, I guess we had a, a five tuple, we extract the encryption of the tracker and the encryption of the vote. And again, we put them through these magical verifiable uh, encryption mixes that I hinted at earlier. Um, and at the end, we can decrypt these pairs, tracker number votes. Okay, so at the end, we get these pairs, which we can post rather like the picture that I showed you a few slides back, okay, with the tracker numbers and the votes in plain text. Okay, so these are now available to everyone. So as I said earlier, if you're being coerced, you can look, look up uh, the coercer's uh, vote and just choose an alternative tracker number that you can claim was what you were assigned and therefore prove to the, vote, to the coercer that you voted the way he wanted. So now we get to the really, well, I'd like to say it's an ingenious part of the scheme. So how do we notify the voters of their tracker in a way which is entirely convincing to them but also allows them to lie to, to, the, uh, to, the, to any coercer? So basically what we do is, at the notification time, we send uh, these values G to the RI. So G is just the generator of the original Elgamal group, if you're interested in the technicalities. And this, at this point, the voter or the voter's device can put this G to the RI term, randomization term, together with the trapdoor commitment. And that actually allows them to treat it as an Elgamal encryption and decrypt it with the secret key that they possess. Uh, but nobody else has that key. So that reveals the tracker uh, to the voter. And why is this rather, rather nice? Um, so there are, there are two factors to this, uh, aspects to this construction. Uh, so if the the, the one aspect is that if you're being coerced with the trapdoor, you can actually com compute an alternative one of these G to the RI terms, which when you insert it into the ciphertext will decrypt to any tracker of your choice. But you need the, the secret trapdoor to do that. And the flip side of this is that if you don't have that secret trapdoor, it's intractable to compute such a GRI, which will decrypt to any tracker of choice. So that's where the assurance of correctness comes, because without this trapdoor, nobody should be able to supply the voter with an alternative G to, G to the RRI, which will decrypt to a valid tracker. Okay, so we get these two aspects 
um, which are precisely what we need. So the voter is confident that their tracker is correctly revealed, but they can still lie uh, to a coercer. Okay, so I think I'm pretty much, I guess I need to wrap up in a few minutes. I'm pretty much there. So I got into some slightly technical stuff there. I'm not sure I may have lost a few people at the end there, but hopefully that doesn't matter too much. I mean, I guess the key point I'm trying to convey is, well, the whole process of digital, uh, digitizing democracy is, is difficult, but in particular focusing on a particular aspect of the problem, which is making the process of actually conducting elections. Uh, that is immensely challenging. There are some nice solutions out there using modern, modern crypto, for example, uh, which allows us to avoid, for example, having to trust Diebold Sequoia code in machines um, so we can actually achieve the guarantees of integrity of the election and ballot privacy with minimal trust. So in a sense, we hand the verification uh, place it in the hands of the voters themselves would be uh, one way of putting it. So this is an immensely challenging problem. I've, I've been working on it uh, for at least the last 10 years. I found it absolutely fascinating. I think we're getting close to some decent solutions, but they're still a somewhat hard sell. Hopefully the last scheme I presented to you might be a bit more appealing to people generally, but I'd love to hear people's reactions. And I think with that, um, I am done. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Peter. Great. OK, so do we see any wavering hands? Yes, the first one here. I have a few questions too, so please go ahead. And please say, please say your name and where you're, where you're from. And try and make when you talk very crisp, because it's really hard to hear up here. Thank you. OK, I'll try. Does it work? So I'm Johan Bustet. I'm the founder of uh, Meridian. We are doing supply chain consultancy normally. So my question is basically, what I see here with the cryptographic uh, stuff is very interesting. And do you see the blockchain as one of the potential distributors? Or do you see any other emerging technologies? So that's what's question one. And okay. I have one more. Uh, and that's... Uh, yeah, I think if you take question one first, okay. and then we'll go on to the second one, so you can answer the first one. Yeah, I, I can only handle one question at a time. Can't, can't that's me too. I know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, that kind of question is actually one which, when people like me give these kind of talks, we routinely get this question. Can you, I, I guess the question is, can I vote on the blockchain or with Bitcoin or something, right? Um, I think the answer that I would give, and I think most of my, my colleagues working in this kind of stuff, is the blockchain doesn't really solve the problem. And, I mean, there are a lot of problems with blockchain, proof of work you know, is environmentally not friendly, and so on and so forth. Um, but also, you know, Bitcoin doesn't guarantee true anonymity, stuff like this. So my view is that blockchains might be useful in constructing this web bulletin board Thing, which is effectively a public ledger. So if you have some good technology to implement the, this notion of a public ledger, then that, that can be useful here. But I think it only really helps with that aspect of the, these kind of schemes. That, that's my personal view. And I'm not quite sure blockchain is the best technology. I mean, I'm, uh, in a few weeks' time, I'm going to financial crypto, and Mich Silvio Michali is giving a keynote on, he's, he's got an alternative, this Algorand, scheme, I don't know if you come across it, which seems to be a bit of a sort of hybrid of blockchain concepts and Byzantine agreement. And my suspicion is that something like that is probably going to be more effective for public ledgers than the pure sort of Bitcoin concept. But certainly, I think we need to get away from proof of work as, as the key mechanism. But anyway, that's perhaps enough on question one, yeah? Good. Okay. So the other one was basically coming uh, of what we heard on the first uh, part with um, Professor Luciano Florodi. Um, so privacy is an old habit in one sense. So is it possible, or do you think, that accountability and knowledge about voting, I guess it's an old question, but um, is, would accountability be part of, of uh, criteria for voting? Uh, ac 
accountability, if I'm understanding well what you mean, is, is very much essential. Um, I think I might even have to pull it up. Now, maybe I skipped it in the interest of time. As more of uh, a philosophical, uh, philosophical thing, I would say that if, if privacy, everything now is saying that we need to be private. And what we're saying with the new age is that privacy is basically not possible uh -huh. in any way. So in that case, would it be possible to say that in order to vote and you're not private, you need to be accountable in order to do it? Is there any well, discussions uh, going on around that? Oh, we, I think there's lots of discussion, in both in context of voting and but more broadly. I mean, if we talk about the sort of surveillance issue, you know, there's a lot of discussion whether pri you, know, you can maintain uh, individual privacy rights in the face of you know, the state's need to try and guarantee security and uh, survey, put suitable sur surveillance in, in place. I think my view and many experts would say these are not, well, they're intention, but they're not necessarily contradictory. With the right technologies and, say, the right cryptographic techniques, we can actually provide both. It's, it's again, it's difficult. I mean, I think I've kind of hopefully given a hint that it's very difficult with voting, uh, but clearly on the grander scale of society, in that sense, it's also very challenging to achieve both of these. I mean, occasionally I was talking to colleagues about these kind of things, and I talked about striking the right balance between privacy and uh, accountability. And they said, no, no, you shouldn't talk about balance. It's not a question of balance. You don't have to balance one against the other. You can actually achieve both. So I think we do have technologies potentially to achieve both and not necessarily have to trade off. Does that answer your question? But it's, it's challenging, again. It's very challenging. Good. Thank you. Ivica. Yes, uh, I, I would like to ask you, uh, like the voting in general does not look like very complicated. There are many other things which are also very complicating and which are working. So my question is, is that not maybe a question of trustworthy? So that people don't trust to the system in which they are not involved, like physically counting. And so maybe in that case we will never have uh, uh, electronic voting because there is no trustworthy, that people don't trust to the system. I'm um, not quite sure I understood your question. I uh, mean, the Dutch have gone back yeah. to just doing a hand counting. Yeah, you, you know, today people are going there, uh, making circles, other people are uh, counting, uh, you know, taking physically these uh, uh, yeah. papers, and, you, and so, so we trust, okay, other people are controlling right. that. But now there is like a system somewhere in the cloud counting, so how we, so people will never trust to that process. Um, well, trust is, is crucial to all of this. Um, and what I've been trying to give you a hint of is you know, some of the attempts by cryptographers and so on to produce systems where uh, we can minimize the trust and make the system as maximally accountable and auditable and, and so forth. Um, and technically, we believe that some of these schemes achieve that. But whether people will actually believe that and trust that, of course, is still a big issue and a big obstacle. And indeed, that's partly why you know, I found myself thinking about the Salini scheme, because now, hopefully, it's much more intuitive, the way you check that your vote is accurately re recorded in, in, the, in the tally process. So trust and conveying trust is, is yeah, a crucial challenge again in itself, and one that we've been thinking about a lot. Um, I, you know, welcome any suggestions how it, how it, how we can help with that. But mm. does that answer your question, Maria? And, and we have another question, but I just wanted to add. I'm sure you've actually uh, talked to people about this and asked them and see, seen if they wanted to actually use it in, in regular elections. Have you have you tried that? And what what has happened? What has the reaction been? Um, well, if you mean the latest scheme, Salini, we, yeah. that's sort of so new that we really have no chance to talk to people much about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the earlier scheme and similar schemes, yes. I mean, I have had lots of discussions with, mm -hmm. well, in fact, when it first came up with it, I was still back in the UK. We mm -hmm. talked to people at the office of the Deputy Prime Minister and so yeah. on. We didn't get much traction with them. No. We did eventually mm -hmm. actually get traction from the Victoria Election Commission, and so it was actually used there. Uh, but it's only been used once, it's not clear whether they're going to use it again. 
Mm. Um, other of my colleagues with different schemes, I think, have had similar experiences. Mm. A couple of these schemes have been used mm. for real, but you know, only once or twice, it's not clear whether they're actually going to take off. Well, it's quite interesting because of what Luciano told us before was that we're sort of at a boiling point of many different things that needs to sort of be equalized and drivers for change. And mm. when you see something like this that sounds quite brilliant and, you know, a good thought behind it and maybe a solution to, to many of our issues when it comes to have efficient voting, uh, you would wonder why is that not a, dr a quick driver for change? But I understand the complexity and why it's, people are so hesitant, of course. But it's yeah. interesting because I think there's many of us who sit with solutions that could actually uh, drive change and drive interesting change faster, but we don't sort of get, as you say, the traction. So, good. Yeah, that's a big challenge. Yeah. Okay, please. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Alejandro uh, Russo from Chalmers. Yeah, so I, I've been talking with some people that are really op that are completely against electronic voting. And they usually say, like, even if you trust a computer, if, it's, if you trust all the software and so on, you are giving away the capabilities that you have today. Like anyone going on the street, you can bring it in. As soon as they know how to count and add, they can control the ballot. Now, with computers, things get more complicated. So not anyone can control the election. So it seems like I would like your, your opinion, like, if, you know, we should give away this power that we have now that anyone can control an election and just trusting more technical people to do that for us. Because you know, all the solution I've seen so far and all these people have been arguing against technologies because you know, things get complicated and then not anyone, any citizen can control the election. They need to have a lot of specific knowledge. What is your reaction about that? Yes. So and I think a, sh a short answer, thank you. <laughs> and a short answer. Yeah, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're basically saying that the traditional way of doing things people understand and, and, and trust. And to some extent, that's true. I mean, I'm not sure, it, it, it depends which con legal context you're in, not necessarily anyone can come in and, and be an observer. And even if you can be an observer, you can only be an observer of certain parts of the process, maybe the counting, but I mean, the, the carrying of the ballot boxes you know, to, the, to the counting station, not, not everybody can you know, observe all of those steps. So there is, there's still elements of trust in, in other people, I think. I mean, no individual person can monitor the in, entire process and convince themselves. And even if they could, I mean, there would still be possibilities for trickery. I guess we don't have to like, go into time. So, I mean, traditional voting systems have been subject to, to attacks, we know, you know, in Chicago and stuff in the States and et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're not f foolproof, but certainly they are, I guess, easier to, for the average person to understand. So that, again, is you know, one of the obstacles that we face. Uh, I, as a sort of cryptographer, think these kind of schemes are technically better, that they do reduce the level of trust that each individual has to, has to have in the system and makes it all mu much more auditable. But yeah, the arguments are subtle, they're complex, and it's not clear that... So, yeah, it's all part of the challenge. Yeah? Good. Thank okay. you, Peter. I'll give you ah. some chocolate and then applaud. Chocolate, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.